like to welcome our viewers to our conversations with the authors of the Journal of Educational Controversy. Our journal is published at the Woodring College of Education at Western Washington University. My name is Lorraine Kasperson, and I'm the editor of the journal. My co-interviewer today is Dr. Kristen French, who is an associate professor at the university, as well as the director of the college's Center for Education, Equity, and Diversity. And my guest today is Dr. Iowana Carduza, who is an associate professor of education at Montana State University in Bozeman. She holds a PhD in Multicultural, Social, and Bilingual Foundations of Education from the University of Colorado at, Ber at uh, Boulder. In 2013, she received the G. Pritchie Smith Multicultural Educator of the Year Award from the National Association for e Multicultural Education for her scholarly commitment to teaching from multicultural perspectives. Dr. Carjusa's research focuses on culturally responsive pedagogy, and she has been instrumental in the implementation of the Indian Education for All initiative in Montana. Uh, the initiative is, a, an, is actually a constitutional mandate that aims to ensure that every student in Montana learn about the distinct and unique heritage and history of American Indians. In the summer of 2010, the Journal of Educational Controversy published an article by Dr. Carduza that was titled, The Giveaway Spirit, Researching a Shared Vision of Ethical Indigenous Research Relationships. Uh, the article was also co-authored with Kay Fenimore Smith from uh, Whitman uh, College. Her talk at Western Washington University on April 8, 2014, will be on the Montana Initiative, Indian Education for All, where she will discuss the seven essential understandings framework that was developed. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our program. Thank you. Uh, and also welcome my co-interviewer uh, to our program. Um, I thought we might start with uh, your article. Uh, that we published in the journal, and then move on to your current work on uh, Indian Indian education. The uh, the issue that you published in was exploring the way in which um, scholarly communities and research communities influence the way in which the public comes to understand issues, uh, the questions it allows them to ask, um, as well as the questions that they cannot ask as a result. And uh, in that issue, many of the authors actually took the opportunity to critique the dominant research uh, uh, paradigms in their, in their area. And I think your paper uh, does do a, a very interesting challenge to the uh, sort of dominant Western paradigm that anthropologists and social scientists have used in uh, researching native communities. And as you argue, uh, that paradigm has often uh, dismissed or ignored uh, indigenous voices and indigenous ways of, of knowing. So I th thought perhaps we might want to start by trying to help our viewers understand the history of the research that has been conducted in uh, Native communities. Uh, as you mentioned um, uh, in your paper, it, uh, indigenous communities have been the most researched communities mm -hmm. in, in the world. Uh, so let's explore a little bit first about the history of the research that was conducted in these Native communities. And what do you mean by indigenous research paradigm as opposed to a Western, indig uh, Western uh, dominant paradigm, and what kinds of uh, ethical issues uh, that conflict between the two pr uh, paradigms uh, poses? Uh, so, sure. 
Uh, well, this whole issue of how best to conduct research in Indian country is something we've been exploring in Montana. We have 12 uh, Plains Indian tribes that would call Montana home on seven reservations. And there is money in research in Indian communities. And unfortunately, a lot of that research has been done in a fairly unethical way. And there are many cases that we can read about on a daily basis. The Havasupe tribe and what happened with the ASU researcher is something that you know everybody talked about in recent times. So being uh, somebody that cares first about the communities I work in and the people that I have relationships with, I've had uh, some difficult choices to make because in order to uh, promote the kinds of in research projects that most universities would like us to be involved in, you have to also think about how uh, grant writing and how the IRB process at the universities really is not compatible with an indigenous worldview and an indigenous ways of being. And so starting to look at different ways that we could be more ethical in our research, it seems to me that if we look at uh, the research that Kirkness and Barnhart did in the early 90s, it's really important that we look at respect, relevance, reciprocity, responsibility, and above all, relationality. And so instead of conducting helicopter or drive-by <laughs> research, I like to think that we build relationships first, and from those relationships, out of those uh, connections and partnerships, we see how we can best serve Native communities. And so it's a different approach. And so uh, there are a lot of incredible Indigenous scholars worldwide doing research on Indigenous methodologies. And it's very different than regular research that focuses on indigenous communities. And so things like the participatory action research and community-based uh, participatory research, although a lot of Western researchers are comfortable with those models, and they're better than some of the research that was conducted before, because they do um, employ uh, research participants in the communities, it's still isn't necessarily generated from the needs of the communities. And so we've been looking at other alternatives. We have several tribes in Montana writing their own IRBs. And even um, doing that, they're still framed within a Western paradigm. And so we, yes. What do you mean by IRB first? Because our audience may not oh, be familiar sure. with the acronym. Well, the inter internal review boards at most institutions make sure that ethical research is going to be carried out. Mm -hmm. um, and for vulnerable populations in particular, we want to make sure that they're protected. And so, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of, what do we say, guidelines in place that really would guarantee that. We've, we've worked on that and we've tweaked our IRB and actually most of the tribes or reservations in Montana actually require that you obtain their um, IRB permission before you do research. I'm working on a project with uh, one of my McNair scholars who's Blackfeet, and we are, have been looking at revitalization and maintenance efforts for the languages that are endangered. And yeah, we had to go to every single individual tribe and get permission to do that in addition to the MSU's IRB process. And I think that's really important that they have say in what data is collected, what, what projects are done, and how that data is used, and how that wisdom and resources are shared. I think it's up to the tribes to make those decisions, not the IRB and research uh, people at the universities. And so. What, what, what's the difference between <coughs> um, an ind indigenous model and a Western model? What would be the different? approach to the research? Well, uh, you know, looking at Sandy Grande's work, Sean Wilson's work, Maggie Kovach's work, Lori Lambert's work, there's tons of indigenous researchers that could explain it better than me. But just looking at it, that it is more holistic, and it does focus on uh, the relationships with individuals, with the land, with um, humanity, with, you know, it's very different than 
uh, there's a very personal side to it. And very often in research, we tell our students that we want them to be totally objective and take themselves out of it. And that doesn't happen in indigenous research and methods. You're very much part of the process and, and part of the research project. Mm -hmm. What was the, some of the recommendations that you made? Uh, I know what you're trying to do is to find a way of bringing these two paradigms together in, a, in, uh, in collaborative research. And perhaps you could ex explain Talk a little, a little bit, bit about that, sure. Well, it's interesting. We just have been working on a project talking about how it is that Indian education for all can thrive in Montana in this anti-ethnic studies climate. And I've mm -hmm. talked with Kristen a lot about that. And so much of Indian education for all is about that collaborative piece. And that's why we're successful. So in research as well, I mean, I would never uh, pretend to have the answers or to be the person that would take the lead on indigenous research, but I can collaborate and partner with my indigenous counterparts so that we can be supportive of each other. And I think that's, that's really key with uh, indigenous research being carried out. Still, the majority of researchers are not indigenous themselves. And we need people to start thinking about how to, how to actually conduct research in a more ethical manner. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about um some of the research that's been done on Native American students' learning styles. Mm -hmm. And um, as you mentioned, uh, an indigenous model tends to look more holistically at issues. Mm -hmm. And yet when I, when I look at this research, it seems to be taken out of context so that people are defined as well, this student, this student is either field dependent or field independent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's a very, it, it breaks down, you know, the uh, learning uh, into very discrete little parts. Um, and I'm wondering, when teachers go to this kind of research uh, in order to find practices for their classrooms, um, what do you see as uh, the possible danger of, of that? Well, the whole, you know, that whole idea of one size fits all, whatever population you're looking at, is problematic. And, you know, the, the idea, well, interesting. Uh, working with uh, the school leaders that I work with in the ILEAD program, uh, principals and superintendents that are indigenous that are going to most likely work in schools on or near reservations with large populations of Indian students uh, still have the majority of their faculty being non-Indian in Montana. And so we looked at a bunch of resources and how they could help prepare their faculty. Uh, many of them are from out of state and even if they have graduated from teacher prep programs in Montana, might not have that sense of culturally responsive pedagogy and how they're going to actually meet the needs of students and help them achieve their academic and social potentials. So we looked at a different, a bunch of different resources and of all the books on how to teach Indian children, they really liked Klug and Woodfield's um, Widening the Circle. And I think uh, what they really have attempted to do is provide a foundation in historical facts, or at least a different perspective on American history, and then talk about successes and different ways to integrate culture and language into the standard curriculum. But they don't focus so much on, you know, this is this kind of student and labeling them, and this is how you have to address them. And so it ends up being best practices for all students, and I think that's a much more realistic way to think about it. So every teacher, uh, whatever their experiences and background that they're bringing to the teaching-learning relationship, they can uh, look at um, how they can empower students to be successful. I think that's important. And we're in uh, Washington State, um, we've also passed legislation trying to uh, promote an understanding of 
um, native culture and, and native history in, in the curriculum. I think it's called In Times Immemorial. Or, mm -hmm. Since Time Immemorial. In, since, since Time Immemorial. Since Time Immemorial, mm -hmm. um, Tribal Sovereignty in Washington State. Um, perhaps so it would be interesting to take a look at how our two states are trying um, to find innovative approaches to meet these, these issues. Um, Kristen, do you want to uh, explore some of those issues with Yeah, our guests? so in 2005, I, I know you know that mm -hmm. um, Washington passed House Bill 1495, which um, originally the, the, um, the legislation that we wanted was a requirement of all teachers in the state of Washington to um, include tribal sovereignty in um, K-12 curriculum. And um, it passed, although the language was a bit different and that it didn't require teachers, but encouraged teachers. Mm. And um, I know in Montana, with Indian Education for All, there was a similar um, legislation, but it was a bit different. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, the Northwest Regional Educational Laboratory, which you're part of that consortium mm -hmm. as well, and I know they changed their name. I can't remember the current acronym. But they actually did a study over a 20-year period and looked at all the states with 16% of the uh, American Indian students across the U.S. Um, participating in their schools. They really wanted to see what we have in place. And Montana was the only state that had all 13 criteria met. And the only state to date that still has as part of their state's constitution, right, you amended this bill or article, right? But you still, um, it's, it's different than what Montana has. And so in 1972, it's a pretty remarkable story, but uh, two students from the Fort Peck Reservation uh, went to the legislate, legislative session in Helena to meet with the 100 delegates, none of which were Indian, and said, um, you know, we'd really like to learn something about our language and culture. You know, we're okay studying Roman history and Greek civilization, but why can't we learn something about us and how we happen to be here? And people listened. And so it was really pretty remarkable that they added to the Constitution in 1972 the language which um, Lorraine shared at the beginning. and. Uh, We've modified that with Indian Education for All in 1999, and we're talking more about the different uh, Indian tribes and their histories and cultures, um, and making sure we include contemporary issues as well. And it's across the curriculum, a P20 initiative for all Montanans, native and non-native. And this idea that uh, we worked on it for a long time, and there are some incredible individuals that have been so dedicated to this, these efforts from the beginning. Um, Carol Juno, Stan Juno, Denise Juno, uh, Everall Fox, Mike Jetty, Joyce Silverthorne. I mean, the list goes on and on. Julie Kajun, the most incredible individuals fighting the good fight. And Mike Jetty likes to talk about uh, this idea that we had much thunder, little rain for many years. So uh, a lot of talk, but nothing was really happening. And it took really, uh, 1997 was a important year because we finally had American, in American Indian Heritage Day put on the books. But that's one day a year. But teachers were required to at least do something, and we thought that was a start. And then 1999, MCA 20-1-501, the amendment to the legislation in 1972 came about. And then from there, it was 2005, and it took a lawsuit <laughs> where we had to define quality education. Indian Education for All was under that explanation. And so uh, finally, funding was, was put towards um, operationalizing the, the um, article. So it was very... Um, important that we had funding. And so from there, the essential understandings were uh, put together in 1999. The Office of Public Instruction brought together uh, tribal leaders, edu educators, uh, participants from all across the state to talk about what are we going to teach now? You know, you've never taught about Indian education. What are we going to teach? And so they uh, 
came up with the seven essential understandings. They thought they would be applicable to all tribes, all reservations, and again, whether uh, we're talking about indigenous peoples in Montana, across the U.S., in North America, around the world, um, we can still look at the kinds of things that are laid out in the essential understandings. So it's our framework, not really standards, but it, it helps uh, teachers to understand what, what the expectations are. And a lot of people will say, well, we have the mandate, the constitutional mandate, so we've got the law on our side. But we do what we do because of the ethical um, commitment and instructional responsibilities. And I think that that's, that's really key. And so working with pre-service teachers, with in-service teachers and uh, school administrators and people in higher ed, uh, what is it we needed? And so um, OPI really talked to teachers and found out that you know mater giving materials was one thing and people needed to build their background information and you know have these um, materials to teach from but they really needed professional development because most educators in Montana and across the US have a very similar journey. Um, maybe in second grade you do something with paper feather hats <laughs> between here and laughing but it's uh, you know the story too well right? Um, so between Halloween and Thanksgiving, and maybe you talk about pilgrims and Indians, and it's a totally unrealistic, uh, one-sided perspective. Uh, maybe you talk about Columbus, you know, and something like that in third grade. Um, again, we're not looking at perspective. Uh, so is it really uh, discovery or encounter? Is it westward expansion or eastward invasion? You know, all those kinds of things we never address. In fourth grade, a lot of our students played Oregon Trail and looked at Lewis and Clark's journey from, you know, <laughs> the Western perspective. And then uh, maybe, I don't know, here in Washington, but, you know, if we're looking at Montana history um, and students are going to take a class, you know, then they might study the Battle of Little Bighorn, and again, very one-sided, and that's it, but it's local, so they'll learn a little bit. But it's world history, and they'll talk about Aztecs and Incas and Mayans and never learn anything about Montana Indians. And um, my good friend Ellen Sweeney, who was the director of um, American Indian and uh, Minority Student Achievement at the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Ed for 20 years, um, she's been retired about five years now, and she shared with me when she started, so 25 years ago, there was not a map of Montana that showed the seven sovereign nations. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things have changed, and, and we work real hard at it, and the Office of Public Instruction is incredible. They've produced tons of materials. They're willing to share things with everybody worldwide. Um, and we even have the National Museum of the American Indian uh, looking at the seven essential understandings to adapt those um, for national Indian education standards. So, You know, I'd like to just, you know, thank you and also... Um, you know, I know there are several folks like Denny Hurtado who worked very hard on the mm -hmm. legislation, who is our previous um, director of Indian education for the state of Washington. Yeah. Um, and now our current um, director, uh, Robin Butterfield. Mm -hmm. um, Montana has been wonderful in terms of sharing resources for the sovereignty curriculum that mm -hmm. we use in Washington. And, um, and Montana has been such a wonderful um, a foundation for other states as well to hopefully move forward in this way. So I'm curious what your um, uh, and Montana's hopes are for the future of Indian Education for All. Yeah, well we, we have so many exciting things going on in the state and I think what's different, um, I went to Maine to visit with Kesey Tanamuk and Paul Frost and others that are involved in their Indian education efforts and I'm not sure what really is going on because implementation is different from what we're saying we want to do. And um, we really want this to be the norm. We want it to be totally infused, integrated across the curriculum in all of our professional development and all of our assessments every, everywhere. Um, I don't, you know, we don't want it to be a standalone course or just in certain classrooms or certain times a year or in certain 
um, units. And so that's, that's the goal, that we wouldn't be having to talk about Indian education for all because it would be the norm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what makes our model so unique because so many others have developed a specific curriculum. It's usually connected to social studies or history classes. It's often an elective. And so it really isn't totally infused. And that's what we're trying really hardly hard to do in Montana. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You referred to the seven essential understandings. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering if you could share that with our viewers. What, yeah, what sure. So starting with essential understanding number one, just, just having a basic understanding of who's in Montana. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I do teach a multicultural foundations course, so they're pre-service teachers and elementary ed and, and a couple of the K-12 um, certification areas and then the 17 secondary areas across the uh, campus as well as early childhood. So it's everybody who's in education. And 60% of our students at Montana State University are probably from Montana. And five years ago when I'd asked them to name the seven reservations or the 12 tribes, hardly anyone could. Mm -hmm. And so that's changed, you know, and some of them actually had Indian education for all in their K-12 education if they've graduated recently. Uh, some of them are non-traditional students and they never had the exposure. But still, they've, you know, a lot of them have lived in Montana their whole lives and didn't know that. So essential understanding number one looks at, you know, who are the different tribes, who are the reservations. We talk about, you know, the fact that we have seven tribal colleges in Montana for each of the reservations. Uh, we look at things like why are the Assiniboine on both um, Fort Peck and Fort Belknap Reservation? Why do we say Blackfeet in Montana, Blackfoot in Canada? Um, what uh, the Little Shell uh, Chippewa um, tribe, you know, how is it that they are not recognized by the federal government? They're landless, but they are recognized by the state of Montana. So we talk about those issues with essential understanding number one. Essential understanding number two really gets at um, addressing this idea of pan-Indianism. And we even see the changes in our language with the legislation, you know, that there's not one Indian. and. And when we're talking about Western paradigm, you know, and indigenous paradigms, that we're comparing two things. But in general, the idea that there's not just one Indian <laughs> or pan-Indian. And it's so funny because I always ask my students, like, who in here would be the model American or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I just did a presentation um, in West Hartford at UConn um, last week, and I asked that same question, and somebody raised their hand. It's the first time it's ever <laughs> happened to me. I'm the model American. So I thought that was really cute. But there's this idea that um, we can look at assimilated, I don't like that term necessarily, but people that are more um, comfortable in mainstream society and people that maybe are more traditional, hold more traditional beliefs, and that they're on a continuum. And we do an exercise often where we ask students to draw an American Indian. And they still will draw people in buckskin and, you know, headdresses and stuff. And, you know, even if it were regalia or whatever, it's, that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking of Indians if, from John Wayne movies. And so we have to make sure people understand that there's Indians today. Um, the Office of Public Instruction did a wonderful Honor Yourself poster series where they had, you know, all these incredible students, and I'll share some of that in the presentation this afternoon. We have some remarkable young people um, at our university, in our state, you know, everywhere, and we want to highlight that, that these are successful Indian students and Indian people, and, and it's important that our students know that. And then essential understanding number three really talks about this idea of spirituality and oral histories and and that this is something that persists today and that it's as unique and different um, among all the tribes, that there's, again, not one, one um, creation story and everybody believes it or whatever, but that that's important. And it's interesting. We've had some pushback because of, you know, the separation of church and state sharing creation stories and stuff as part of literature um, units in Indian Ed for All. But in general, you know, looking at those um, different um, aspects. And then essential understanding number four uh, addresses this whole idea of um, reservations and what they mean mm -hmm. in our American Indians 101 fact sheet that the Office of Public Instruction puts together. It's set up as a question-answer kind of 
uh, format so that people can get the answers to the most basic questions. And I hear every day, you know, the reservations are land that the federal government gave to Indians. And so really um, in a state like Montana with the Dawes Act and allotment and what happened, um, people need to understand that. And so uh, that's what essential understanding number four addresses. And essential understanding number five looks at uh, all the different time periods and the different treaties and statutes and um, executive orders and how the government uh, made decisions that affected Indians in the past and that they persist today, the kinds of impact. And so uh, very often, like we said in the journey, students might know a little bit about the colonization period because I work with educators, we really look at the boarding school era. And so many students never heard of it, you know, or they think boarding school and they're thinking of those elitist prep schools on the East Coast that you see in uh, Dead Poets Society. <laughs> you know, they have no idea what really happened. And so we talk about that and the impact and generational trauma and why um, students and their families might not feel welcomed or like they want to be part of the education system. Um, and of course self-determination is a big part of that and with Indian Education for All how can we partner with Indian leaders and community members to help them achieve their goals and dreams. And then six is this whole idea of history and that it is just you know a perspective and that there are multiple perspectives and we want to be more inclusive. And so we look at alternative histories, uh, Howard Zinn, James Lowen, Ronald Takaki, you know, uh, you know, uh, for sure, Vine Deloria Jr., Daniel Wildcat, this idea that, you know, we, we need to learn, you know, I don't know, the truth is so ambiguous in anybody's perspective. But, you know, having uh, multiple perspectives um, shared and, and honored and having people come to their own conclusions instead of just uh, the status quo of what's normally taught. And an essential understanding number seven deals with this whole concept of sovereignty. And um, I would think most students aren't even really clear what it means that the United States is a sovereign nation. But you know the kind of relationship that um, the tribes and the sovereign nations have with the federal government and that uh, within that, this whole idea of how tribal members um, identify and how they are different than any other minority group. Minority, we don't like that term either, but minority group in the United States because of their unique status, that they're citizens of the United States, citizens, if they live in Montana, the state of Montana, and citizens of their tribal nations if they're enrolled members or where they identify or feel they belong. So those are the seven essential understandings that help frame our instruction and research and everything we do. That sounds very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm actually just really excited um, to have you in SEED today and um, I'm really hoping that um, educators and, and our pre-service teachers have an opportunity to um, learn from Indian Education for All and from you. And um, Iwana is going to be speaking also about um, higher education, how to support American Indian students in higher education and the kinds of models that they use. And actually, I, I'm, I am curious about um, what are some of the things that you'll share with our students today um, on the fa family education model. Oh, the family education model, sure. Well, Richard DeSellis and Irish Pretty Paint Heavy Runner have done incredible research on resiliency and looking at what it is uh, we can do in higher ed to support students to um, persist and to graduate and to, to move on and have choice in their lives. And so we have incredible support systems in place at um, Montana State University and we partner with families and tribal communities, and then we have um, internally support systems for students so that they aren't isolated, so that they can um, feel part of the MSU culture, and that they can share their cultures as well. And so it's uh, something we've worked on and continue to work on, and 
we have very successful discipline specific programs and then we have more general support services with American Indian Council and Native um, American Studies program staff and faculty and, and then of course many others across campus. Exciting, thank yeah. you. We're so happy that you're here. Well, I'm so happy to be here. I'm really excited to learn more about Bill 1495, yes, because mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about it and, I, and I'd really love to see what you are doing and I'd love to see your curriculum. Great. So, yeah. Well, the nice thing about um, uh, the Since Time Immemorial um, curriculum is that it's all online. Okay. And so it's accessible Wonderful. to everyone, which was Great. Um, really a forward thinking move for the folks that organized it in the, yes. in the tribal communities. And um, also that, you know, one wonderful aspect which is, I'm not sure how I feel about Common Core Standards um, across the board, but mm -hmm. um, the Sovereignty Curriculum was the first curriculum in the state of Washington that was um, directly connected to the Common Core Standards. So well, that's fantastic. Again, our yeah. Native yeah. community is so forward thinking. That's great, that's great. Is it a curriculum geared towards high school? students? Is it for everybody? Is it at all grade levels? I yes. Don't. So they, um, the developers, and it was a team of folks that worked mm -hmm. um, in the Office of Indian Education, um, which is now called ONE. I believe ONE stands for the Office of Native Education. Mm, I like that. Yeah, I do too. And um, it's really K through 12, and mm -hmm. I'm sure we could do P through 12 if, you know, just working with it. So um, they, they wanted the curriculum to be accessible to all teachers. So they made sure that if there's different tiers of the um, curriculum, so if a teacher wanted to just um, have one lesson that they wanted to incorporate, they could do that. Another tier would be for um, uh, teachers to maybe do a unit or to integrate it throughout their um, curriculum would be the third tier. So, um, and that's for K through 12. So for all subject areas, it's wonderful. They have a That's conceptual great. framework and an indigenous conceptual framework that they, they model the curriculum through. That's so great. It's really exciting. And has there been professional development for K-12 teachers? Yes, and that is, um, I, I see now Robin Butterfield um, mm -hmm. is traveling all over the state and doing um, curriculum development, or I'm sorry, professional development for mm -hmm. um, communities. So mm -hmm. this is for... Um, Native faculty staff, um, but also for um, you know our our teachers all over the state. So she's busy. That's great. Yeah. Well, I love the Journal of Educational Controversy, and so I was really honored that you published the piece. And I think we need to do a I collaborative do piece. I would love to to <laughs> do the yeah the parallels and contrasts between yes. what's happening in Washington and what's been going on in Montana. Yes. Yeah. And I'm hoping that Washington will learn from Montana and, and vice and, versa. <laughs> and, you know, I'm hoping that at some point we make it a requirement for mm -hmm. all of our teachers in the state of mm -hmm. Washington to include indigenous history and, um, and sovereignty. That's wonderful. You know, um, our current issue of the journal is on the theme, who defines the public in public education? Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it really was sparked by in the incident that occurred in uh, Arizona mm -hmm. uh, when um, the multicultural uh, program there, the Mexican-American uh, studies, uh, was banned mm -hmm. by the state of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And one of the teachers, um, Curtis Ocosta, uh, came to our university. He published an article in that issue, yes. and he talked about that censorship. And it seems to me that uh, it's very easy for administrators, legislator, legislators, policymakers uh, to promote alternative perspectives in the curriculum as long as they are safe. Mm -hmm. uh, once they begin to question, once they begin to express their own authenticity, once they begin to voice their own voices, 
then suddenly there's this political opposition that, that starts to emerge. And I'm, I noticed a number of, of areas that you mentioned in the seven uh, essential learnings. Um, when you talked about how traditionally we talk about Columbus discovering America or instead of invading America, um, when you talked about um, the notion of reservations being given to Indians, well, they were never given to. Once you begin to, you know, critique that kind of multiculturalism, um, very often you have this sort of uh, backlash. And I'm wondering, was there any political opposition or, in, or backlash in Montana over this curriculum? <laughs> and is there still? <laughs> and is it ongoing? <laughs> of course, yes. Yes, and we, and we um, have looked a lot at that because, of course, I'm surrounded by the choir, Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no question, even the resistance that you get with pre-service teachers. I wrote a chapter for Innovative Voices, which was a wonderful collection of educators around the world trying to implement culturally responsive pedagogy. And I uh, went through and I had been collecting, of course, from my students cultural autobiographies and um, different surveys and interview uh, opportunities and stuff, different things that they had said. And there's no question, there's a lot of resistance. Um, and there's a lot of questioning. Uh, but the higher, well, the higher, the um, more educated people are, in some ways, it makes them more skeptical. And uh, yes, we definitely have people that uh, think it's divisive, that think it's not appropriate, that don't want um, why are we focusing on Indians anyway? Um, you know, I, I did learn the truth, you know, and uh, I learned it from the victors, so I know it's the truth. So there's no question uh, we face a lot of that. Uh, what we try to do um, is say that, you know, I know with uh, Tucson Unified Public School District, and, and we've talked about it, there's no question you use Palo Freire and people automatically think you're anti-American. Um, but we try to focus on this whole idea of being educated is, is something that we want our students to be and that they have to make uh, choices. And we should, there's nothing neutral about education, I guess, at all. And so we at least try to focus on that, that, that uh, we're trying to be honest about what, what the status quo is and what the purpose of education has been and that Indian education has existed time immemorial and um, only the intersection with the colonized uh, societies has it become problematic in some ways. But I, I understand what you're saying and this, this is an interesting aside, but um, one of my godchildren teaches in El Paso, Texas. And you know, I taught at CU Boulder, was in Colorado for a long time, and every year on Columbus Day there were huge you know, controversial um, petitions and all kinds of things going on. There was always some kind of protest on the Capitol building. And that's what I grew up with, and that's what we kind of do in Montana. I always have one of my Indian Education for All events you know, as an alternative for a celebration for Columbus Day. Um, and so, you know, the criticism is something that I've heard for a long time. Anyway, my godchild sent me um, articles and stuff. They were actually trying to dismantle a statue of Columbus in El Paso, and people were furious. They were like, you know, I'm proud and, and whatever, I'm whatever I am, Spanish, uh, Italian, Portuguese, whatever, and I, I want this statue of Columbus. He's a hero and stuff. And so, but again, I think looking at the truth, you know, really looking at the Declaration of Independence and how Indian peoples are portrayed and reading Lowen's history and seeing how, you know, the, these things are done intentionally. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, if we want people to be educated, then we are going to uncover <laughs> some of those untruths. We just had a celebration on Thanksgiving and I had Kisi Tanamuk, who's a Wabanaki elder, come out and share, you know, a totally different view. And it, it came about because of, um, what can we say, 
controversy on campus about the OPI materials, which we all support. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's take Columbus for, for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, some of the opposition that um, emerges, especially if we change the term discovery to invasion, um, begins to see this as a um, kind of an, uh, how should I put it, um, as a, uh, well, as a form of indoctrination. Um, how do we approach Columbus in a more sophisticated, um, complex uh, understanding that doesn't go to either extreme, but tries to um, show the complexity of life, the ambiguities involved in, in history, the uh, ambivalences that go on. And in other words, a rich history um, that uh, um, students need to be able to make choices about. Well, I think it's, I think it has to be students' decisions. I think it's, it's our um, duty to make sure that they learn critical literacy skills. And when you talk about indoctrination, I think we do that from day one in mm -hmm. schools, but it's the mainstream <laughs> messages that we are supporting all along. So there is indoctrination. I mean, if we think of uh, the promise that education is the great equalizer, you know, Horace mm -hmm. Mann's uh, declaration that that's what we're trying to promote here, then I think that we owe it to, uh, to everyone to look at what, the, what has really happened. And I think we need an honest look at that. And I think we don't do that at all in public education in this country. And it's challenging. And there's no question. Uh, maybe you remember uh, at a couple years ago when it was, what would it would have been, the 50th year anniversary of uh, the bombs being dropped on Hiroshima? There was a presenter um, at uh, one of the elementary schools in Bozeman. I didn't even know about it, but I had emails from everywhere in the world because of the principal's response, because a few parents were furious. You know, we have a lot of people participating in the military in uh, Montana, and it was not meant to be disrespectful to them or whatever, but, you know, maybe they didn't really know what this individual was going to share, but she was a survivor and had horrible stories to sell and to tell, to sell. Oh my gosh, what kind of slip was that? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's what people thought it was, propaganda. People were furious and um, again, it started all kinds of anti-American sentiment and stuff and, uh, you know, it was handled very poorly. I often found it ironic that so many of the attacks on um, alternative curriculums like the one in Arizona um, are often defined as indoctrination, mm -hmm. but never we never look at the curriculum that exists as indoctrination. Of course it is. <laughs> and so what you end up with is this um, dichotomy of positions, and the dialogue is one which each side, in a sense, just accuses the other side of indoctrinating, mm -hmm. and we never seem to be able to find a way to communicate about these issues, to talk about what education is and what it's supposed to do, as, as you're, you're, you're pointing out. Um, I think one of the things the journal is trying to do is to discuss the complexity of these issues, mm -hmm. to look at the multiple dimensions of, of, of the issues, uh, and try to educate the public uh, up, about it. Mm -hmm. The term culturally responsive pedagogy has been used a lot. And um, I noticed in your, in your essential uh, understandings framework, a lot of it has to do with understanding um, the, uh, the, a more truthful, more authentic un, uh, background, uh, especially a factual background. Um, is, what else goes into a culturally responsive pedagogy? I think we've thought for too long that education is really neutral, and I think it's important to understand that our life experiences, 
need to be validated and our cultural heritage is valued. We need to see ourselves in that collective description of the United States if uh, we want to feel part of that. And um, I, I, how, how to explain it, I don't know. Uh, we really make sure that people understand that teachers bring their culture and their life experience to the, experiences to the classroom. We've talked for years about the mismatch, about who the teachers are in the 1,200 teacher prep programs across the United States. The majority of people are still white, middle-class females. We describe them as monocultural. We lump them all together as if they're clones of each other. But um, the truth is we don't have a lot of people of color, people that grow up in other situations um, socioeconomically. Uh, and so, again, it's a way to perpetuate the status quo because we have like thinkers together. And so I think it's really important that we understand that if you're not somebody that's grown up in poverty, if you're not somebody that's struggled in school or not seen yourself reflected in the curriculum, that it's really hard to buy into it. And so I think it's really important that we, um, in a culturally responsive manner, that's the terminology we use in our legislative um, commitment, is that you know we really understand that students are people <laughs> and that uh, we need to make sure that we address their individual needs and desires and everything else in the classroom as well. So I think you know this idea of a constructivist view where you're creating with your class um, and that you're all teachers and learners at, at one point I think is really important. Ask along those lines too. Um, yeah. We had a wonderful conversation yesterday where we were talking about the difference between cultural competence and um, other, you know, ways of knowing and being in the classroom, um, and as teachers and educators. And you had mentioned that with the Indian Education for All, you use the term cultural humility. Right, and and I, I um, Sweeney Winchief uses that all the time. I think it's a much better approach. You know, this idea of cultural competence especially makes it seem like a journey and you arrive at a point. And I think that's problematic. Uh, we want to think of the idea that we all have different life experiences and that we all are always learning. And so I think um, it's really important that um, we value all cultures equally and everybody's experiences. And so I like the idea of cultural humility um, I was wondering, is there anything you would like to share with our uh, viewers here in Washington um, about the work that you're, you're uh, trying to do in Montana? Well, people ask me all the time why I do it. It's the right thing to do, <laughs> but um, I'm also hooked on hope. I mean, that's the only way I can continue uh, doing what I do. And I have wonderful support systems. Um, there are people that I that I really enjoy so much working with. And the struggles, um, we keep widening the circle. Each time, uh, you know, or casting the net a little further or whatever you want to say. So that's always exciting. Um, the Indian Ed for All professional development workshops, which I've offered over the past eight years, we've had 15. I've been able to bring in Julie Kajun, uh, Henrietta Mann, um, James Lowen, uh, Kisi Tanamuk, uh, all the poets from Birthright to Poetry. I mean, we've had just unbelievable opportunities. It's been just amazing, and I'm so humbled and honored to, to know these individuals, to have the chance to work with them, to invite them to campus. And um, within the state, I mean, everybody is accessible. We truly are a community, mm -hmm. and that makes such a difference. And we have, you know, all these incredible successes. Look at Denise Juno. I mean, it's incredible as our superintendent of education. She's the first American Indian woman to ever be elected at a state office in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she's Blackfeet Mandan Hadatsa. And again, the legacy of her family. And um, I think, you know, it's such important work. And so all the people that I have a chance to, to work with make the difference. And, and I'm happy to and honored to be part of that. So, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for 
for joining oh, us. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Kristen, for yes. being here. It's an honor. Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, remind our, our viewers uh, that the article that you published appears in the summer 2010 issue of our journal. So until uh, next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.